Hello, good afternoon, Andrew. Um, Hello. Could you possibly just introduce yourself and also your role here at Vendalanda? Okay, well, my name is Dr. Andrew Burley. I am the Director of Excavations and Research for the Vindalanda Trust. Now, some people may know about Vindalanda, some people may not. Uh, I, I'd be amazed if the people who watch um, our case wouldn't know about Vindalanda. Mm -hmm. Could you just briefly explain what this site is? Vindalanda is a frontier fort and settlement at the very edge of the northern frontier of the Roman Empire, which dates to the sort of early conquest of our area from about AD 85, encompasses the whole of the Roman period, then goes on, rumbles on for another four or five hundred years. So it's a whole series of forts built on top of each other by different garrisons and uh, was populated by lots of people in history in the past. Okay, okay. Now, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, obviously it being a Roman fort and being a very long-lived and facing various directions and many generations, uh, this site is particularly interesting because it is owned by and run by a trust, so there's no pressure on, on the archaeologists here, as they might be saying a commercial pick, to, <laughs> to get stuff absolutely done. I yeah. have to say, there seems to be, from the outside at least, mm. uh, no big pressures as other archaeologists might have. Is that true? And if so, is it a blessing or a curse? Ooh, I mean, I, to answer the question properly, I say there are different pressures, obviously. You know, um, we, we're not bankrolled or funded by any other sort of organisation. We, we have to generate through people covered to visit the site, the income to be able to continue the work. But certainly, yes, unlike commercial, nobody's, uh, I haven't got a bunch of builders standing around me waiting for me to get out of the way so they can pour the concrete in behind me. And uh, that sort of pressure is removed. But we still have the pressure of being able to try and get the job done in a, in a sensible amount of time, using the resources that are available to the best of our abilities. And of course we have to work within a wider framework for the research of Hadrian's Wall and frontiers of the Roman Empire. And then of course there's the pressure with Vindalanda being a very well known site and getting that information out to a, to a high enough quality that it can justify the work being done. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of pressure, but it's perhaps not the same sort of pressure that well, in, in, in a sense that every other um, perhaps unit or, or different specialist may encounter. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, each, each job is unique in its own way, and that's one of the things no doubt we'll be highlighting or will come through, and Vindalanda has its own unique pressures to go with it. In that sense then, uh, is that uh, possibly a good thing about this not being uh, a site which is, I suppose, just run by one person or, or even, dare I say, owned by one person? You actually do have, say, a steering group, you do have the whole of the wall, people, and in fact, you know, the, the press even wanting to know what's going on here. Is, does that actually drive you, you forward in your research? Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, obviously, the more collegiate you can be, the more information that can be cross-fed, the more people involved up to a certain point, as long as there's a, a sort of cohesive idea of where, the direction where you want to go, um, can be hugely good and supportive. And I think that's where, we, where we're at, that's what we've got mm -hmm. in terms of the community that's built around Vindalanda. I mean, I have myself and my, my core staff who work here all the time, but there are 70 or 80 different specialists who individually or as groups interface with what we do. So it's, it's a very big community that's built around the excavation and the research on this site. And that's a healthy thing, mm -hmm. absolutely a healthy thing. And of course it constantly changes. Mm -hmm. People come and go with different research ideas, angles, and, and the power of the Vindalanda material is it's such a large database, there's such a lot of work that's taken place here, that a lot of different questions can be asked and answered, hopefully, that you can't necessarily get from other sites where you do a little bit here or a little bit there, or a watching brief or, or something like that. So it, it opens up a different portfolio of things that you can have a go at, mm -hmm. and that, that brings sometimes some very, very interesting angles out of the archaeology. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the um, of course you're right, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we just don't <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. is, um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of the site and of coming mm -hmm. to the museum. Mm -hmm. um, it seems every year there is something very exciting uh, which is discovered, be it a shoe or a really interesting piece of jewellery or a new, a new uh, plumbing network, whatever it is that, <laughs> that is discovered. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose that, that medium, I suppose we, we hesitate to use the term long term in archaeology because obviously we have a much longer long term than most people. Yeah, we do. But um, that sort of medium term ability to return to and to, to interrogate an archive which is very, very 
I suppose, well packaged, it must be uh, an incredible advantage to people who do come here to do research. I mean, yes. how, how much do, do you find that people are, I suppose, surprised by what they find here? And then how much are you inspired by the work that they do? I mean, is there a is there a, a sort of a... Oh, well, there is a, there is, there is a two-way process, mm -hmm. for, certainly, certainly. People come along and sometimes they come along and they, they look at a particular aspect of the collection and then they become slightly sidetracked or overwhelmed because there's just so much stuff. Mm. But that opens up different avenues. And one of the nicest things about working at Vindalanda is the amount of cross-collaboration you get. So researchers coming in with a particular angle, an idea, and then you can get them in touch with three or four different people and say, hey, hang on a second, look at this, have you thought about it this way? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we get people coming in and look at our turned wood and then they realise well, hang on, we've got beer, beer vessels and stuff like that, and that taps into writing tablet research, which mentions beer and so on and so forth. And these are how things go, all the way down to the science of you know, where, where does the wood come from, how do they cure the wood, the chemical aspects, and then chemists come along and get involved in that. So that's the sort of cross-collaboration which happens quite a bit. Mm. And some of it's planned, and some of it's quite organic. It just mm. sort of happens by getting people into the same room in the same space. But that, that's the... The excitement that bubbles on behind, if you if you like, the visible face of what we do in Delanda, mm -hmm. which is why in a given year so many different research papers and bits of information come out. The excavations are always exciting. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't really have a dull year <laughs> or a dull day or a dull week at this site. Um, but yes, I mean, if you work here long enough, you get you get armoured to certain things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if we find another Roman shoe, for instance, I may not, my pulse may may not take off in the stratosphere, and you know, I may not jump, <laughs> jump for joy. <laughs> um, when you find a few thousand, that's yeah. kind of what happens. Yeah. But for the person who comes along and excavates, and that special interaction for them to have their hands on that, for them to excavate that, and be the first person to see that. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible thing. And of course, that sort of energy is another aspect of one of the things which keeps you going and, and helps you to love your job, is having new people coming into the system mm -hmm. and getting that energy, that desire, um, you know, that satisfaction from their very own work coming back and reflecting on the rest of the group. It's okay. great. Okay. It's very positive. So on that, that topic of how, there's in particular, for example, the, the famous Vindalanda tablets mm -hmm. um, do feed back into, and also I suppose move some elements of archaeological work into the realm of historical research, because you have documents <laughs> and you have, you have the ability, well, for example, to, to estimate numbers of soldiers. Yes. Yes. That's, that, uh, I won't necessarily go too much into that, because that's been talked about all over the place. And, uh, well, I mean, the only, the only thing I would say, mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, which is very, very important, is just to remember that the the tablets are artifacts. Mm. They're, they're artifacts. They're part of the archaeological artifact database and record. And a lot of work, a lot of studies have been done on the tablets, talking about the text, and, uh, you know, teasing information out, which is yeah, great. Birthday invitation. Birthday invitation. You know, and there, and there are people who highlight you know, particular examples. But each individual tablet, their, their true um, one of their true values, if you will, is that they are. They're artifacts. They're as much an artifact as a Roman coin, a bit of pot, or anything else. And like like all these things, context is the key. So mm -hmm. that's that's the true, real value in many ways, mm -hmm. which I don't think perhaps is still completely recognised. Um, so you know, we do think of them as historical documents. Of course, they are, and it does open up, as you say, that historical link. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line, they're stuff. They're artifacts. They're objects. Um, uh, and we have to treat them like that on the archaeological side. Yeah. Um, I hasten to say, I, I wasn't maligning the. Oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 I wasn't thinking of that. But, but, um, yeah. You might actually, yeah, I suppose. So the reason why I wasn't necessarily going to go too much into it is that mm. I think if people really want to know more about how they're preserved, I'd encourage them to come to the museum yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. And we do know I may talk about it as another, on another occasion. Um, but I think what, what, what fascinates me about. I suppose the potential of all this, and also the, the, that material. So the artifactual material, the documents as artifacts, and yes. also the documentary evidence, um, is actually the 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 picture that we can paint here mm -hmm. um, of life during its occupation. Now, I was going to say during Roman times, but there's no such thing as a Roman time. Is there? no. There's no such thing as, as no. just a Vindolanda. No. What would you say? if you have the opportunity, to someone about, 
I suppose about the Roman Empire and before and after in Britain. That is to say, that's a bit, that's a very broad question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How long has somebody got to listen to? <laughs> well, <laughs> right. The reason why I was just mind by it is that yeah. with the shoes, for example, mm. um, one of the things I always try and point out, especially for example in schools or whatever, is that actually Romans didn't look like Mediterranean you know, sandal wearing skirts and all the rest of it um, for, for that long. When they came here, they started wearing trousers, they started wearing shoes, they started changing and adapting their behaviour. And it's only that sort of the, that you constantly try and reinforce and, I, I, or would like to in, in the mind of the public, perhaps. I think the most, the most simple way to put the message across is that we now, in our modern world, think of life as, as vastly complicated and, and diverse and difficult sometimes, but in the past, um, you know, the, the, the concepts we, we have today are not new. No. Uh, I can give you a very good example. I mean, when, when trying to describe what a Roman is, it's, it's a pretty basic, fundamental thing. A few years ago, we found the skull of a young man who'd been killed, and his skull had rolled into the rampart of one of our fault ditches. It had been mounted on a pole, on a stake. And we used science, after its excavation, to try and work out where this person had come from. So we did some lead and isotope, oxygen isotope analysis on this person's teeth. He had four teeth left. Mm -hmm. And we pulled one and sent it away to be ground up to get some information. And what came back was that this person had drunk their water in our region all their lives. They didn't seem to have travelled very far. So we thought, right, great, native Britain, nasty little Britain, rebellious, most likely, killed by the Roman army, head put on a rampart. You native Britons behave yourselves, you know. Mm -hmm. Strong message from Rome. Imperial possession, suppression, however you want to put it. Very much, you know, barbarians versus Romans. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A very binary thing. Mm -hmm. This year, we got some more information from that skull. And we pulled another teeth, another tooth, sorry, sent it away. So only two teeth left now. I'm running out of teeth. And not that the person needs them anymore, <laughs> <laughs> to be sure. Sent the next tooth away uh, because DNA has come a long way. In the, in the intervening 10 years since we originally found the skull. And the DNA analysis came back, and it, it astounded us slightly because it said that on the paternal line, on the father's line of this individual, this person actually had Italian DNA. So that raises a whole mm. new set of questions. Mm. And you know, how did this person get to have their head mounted on a, on a spike at a Vindolanda fort and mm. roll into the ditch? Was this person a member of the military community or, or a Briton? Were we right the first time? Were we completely wrong? Mm -hmm. How did this person get to be who they were and where they were? Mm. And, and that's the challenge, really. Mm. It, and one of the things that we have to do as archaeologists, I think, is break down those very simple statements, the very easy binary terms. Mm. Life was complicated. Mm. And we have to... We have to first of all accept the probability that life was complicated mm -hmm. and only then can we start trying to work out what it was really like and, mm -hmm. and that's our challenge. Excellent, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> something I'm, I'm constantly talking about. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a mistake to, as opposed to, to inherit the you know, couple of generations old assumptions about the past. Yeah. For example, in, in Britain with this whole idea of there being a military zone and there being this very clear, almost like no man's land. I mean, you, you know, we're finding villas in County Durham, we're finding all sorts of things which, which, which yeah. contradict that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, life was complex in the past, and life is complex now, and uh, long may it continue. Now, um, <laughs> it makes it far more interesting, doesn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. Without a doubt, without a doubt. No. Well, and actually, I suppose, yeah, in a nutshell, if it was just, well, the Romans were here, the Romans brought baths, and the Celts were horrible people, or Britons, more correctly, were horrible people um, who didn't wash, then why would you be bothering with your research? If that was just the case, then there's no point in, in researching it. You know? no, no. So, uh, no, very good. Um, we need to move beyond the cartoon characters. Uh, well, I suppose coming back to, to you um, as, as a person, mm -hmm. um, how did you get into archaeology? What, what actually was your, your, <laughs> your pathway? Oh, I suppose you could say, in, in one sense, I didn't have a choice because I had, I had an archaeological grandfather, mm -hmm. father, ancient historian uncle, mm -hmm. curatorial mother. Um, and my forward of youth, family holidays were visiting parts of the Roman Empire. Okay. You know, sites, mm -hmm. 
I have my bottom burnt on Roman toilets for photographs right across the Mediterranean. <laughs> you know, not even that put me off. And um, when I was old enough to take part in the excavations, which was about from the age of 15, because they were very, very deep when I was, I was younger. This was the, the, the very deep excavations taking place, 30, 35 feet deep. You had to be a certain age to be able to take part. I took part and, and got hooked. Went away to university, went to Leicester to do my undergraduate, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So, yeah, and joined the, if you will, the sort of, not the family enterprise, but the family passion um, mm. from that point. Mm. And, and have been a field archaeologist there for, for oh God, show my age now, for almost about 25 years. So, yeah, yeah, okay, absolutely. I've served the same length of time as a Roman soldier. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I can't retire, not yet. No, no, no. <laughs> so, but, uh, so there we go. Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 that is, I suppose, in many ways, it is admittedly an unusual um, situation to be in. Yeah. Um, and here, although I do like the description of your mother as being a curatorial mother, where she labels your toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, she's, uh, she's a curator, but yes, she's also a curatorial. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> But um, it, is, it is an unusual path, and, and so. Uh, given that, that in this series of interviews I've, I've sort of talked to people who maybe at one point were you know, working in the, in the, the theatre mm -hmm. and eventually became archaeologists or yep. people who, who uh, just had a passion maybe just after watching it in, in Jenna Jones even and then became archaeologists. Mm -hmm. would, would you recommend that, that, that small people are if, they, if, they, if there is a possibility of Smaller people, go on, what do you mean by that? Well, yeah, so, <laughs> children. So, you know, okay. children, children are actually they're, they're, yeah. they're exposed to, to archaeology as young as possible so that they can get a sense of what it is. And I suppose, again, sort of slightly combating that cartoon and maybe developing an actual passion. Or, or, or do you think maybe you were guided a bit too much down a certain path? I don't know. I mean, I, there are various people trying to sort of either put me off mm. or um, persuade me to become a prehistorian or something like that, which I wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> I did the flint mapping course, but it wasn't for me. Um, did you find yourself mapping? No, well, <laughs> that, <Sorry. laughs> that would be me getting into a lot of trouble. But mm. uh, um, yeah, I, I, my personal belief is that people come to history and archaeology at different stages of their lives. And it's it's no good trying to you know shoehorn them in or, or push them into it. The amount of people we see here at Vindalanda coming into archaeology in their forties and their fifties is, is inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's great. Mm -hmm. People who come from as you say all different walks of backgrounds, lifestyles, everything from you know hairdressing to a high court judge um, we've had through the system here. And at some stage in their life, they've realised. Well, hang on a second. I want to know more about this, mm. and uh, I want to become involved, which is which is the next step and an important step to make. And, and the nice thing about archaeology is, of course, you can. And it's mm. one of the few professions, the few disciplines where you you can go from zero to, to quite a lot mm. um, with as long as you have that energy and that passion within you. In terms of children, I think a lot of children are naturally curious about archaeology and history because. Archaeologists use a, a set of tools in many ways, and they, children can use those tools and apply them to answering their own questions, and that's hugely empowering. Mm -hmm. But again, it, I, I recommend a, a slightly more hands-off approach in the sense that people, to have a true passion and love for archaeology and history, almost have to discover it themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's an important message. From my own experience, um, from uh, watching thousands of children, but also volunteers um, come through the side of Indalanda. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I do remember actually as, as a child, uh, well, when I was very, very young, being obsessed with castles. Mm -hmm. I think that's possibly where, where I started, when I was about five or six. But yep. at the same time, I also remember my friends, when we'd go on to the school trips, some of them would just be... Looking at girls or, or uh, you know, waiting for it to end. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just, just Preferring just to wait, you know, just thinking about a lunch, for example. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay, well, well you, you've sort of touched on one of the questions that, that I try to ask everyone, and that is, I suppose, advice for aspiring archaeologists. It sounds like you're, you're one of those archaeologists who, who, who um, is inspired by the fact that people can and do want to just, just dive in and get involved. 
Um, so I, I won't really touch on that, but, but I suppose what uh, for you is, is one of the best things about, about being an archaeologist? Okay, well the best thing about being an archaeologist is, is actually seeing something change, sometimes quite rapidly, through your own efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's one of the few things I think in life where you can actively engage and see change, but also have the opportunity, the chance to fundamentally change our perception, perception of history, and, mm. uh, and that is incredibly empowering. So I think that word empowering um, is an important one about archaeology. Mm. You know, it gives people a normal sense of well-being, satisfaction, and empowerment. But also, there's you know, it's a, it's an incredible community as well. Mm. It's an incredible community, and for a lot of people, they find archaeology as a way of finding a new community. And it's a very welcoming and warm community on the whole. Not always, but on the whole. And because it's such a broad discipline, there's a niche or, or a place there for practically everybody who wants to get involved. And, mm. and again, that, I think that's quite a rare thing. Mm. Um, you know, in terms of getting involved, and if you're if you're starting and you say, well, where do I go? Right? So it, it can understandably be overwhelming. Like most people will probably say, you know, get as much and varied experiences as you can until you find something which clicks mm -hmm. and you think well that's yeah that's what I want to do that's where I want to be um, and that's the advice we always give to everybody who comes onto the site mm -hmm. and uh, who comes through the system and it's advice that I was you know was passed down to me and in my formative years I didn't I wasn't always a Roman archaeologist I did various excavations on medieval Monmouth I did stuff in Israel and all sorts of things and it's one of the few, again, disciplines which enables you to do that, to really taste lots of different things until you find something that you'd order again and again. And mm. that's, that's the message I would give. Yeah. Okay. So almost uh, finding, for me, uh, my favourite cake is a bake well. So almost finding your bake well. Find your bake well. Exactly, like, yeah. find your bake well. <laughs> um, you and every there. now and then try something else just to make sure you still have the taste oh, yeah, of bake yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, sometimes try, yeah. A, yeah, try a tiramisu or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, well, well yeah. uh, <laughs> incidentally, the, uh, I did, um, just before we started our interview, have uh, my lunch here at the cafe. Oh, good, good. Great pleasant, uh, lovely tray um, Anyway, cakes to one side. Uh, you, you, actually, you mentioned the, the range, uh, actually mm. trying to find a niche within, the, because you know, our world recreators, there's a whole range of things, there is. Know, from psychology to engineering, uh, that people can actually engage with with archaeology. Mm -hmm. What would you define yourself as? a tough one isn't it that's a tough one i think i'm a generalist in the sense that um with my particular role as director of excavations i have to be able to do everything from basic excavation skills field survey interpretation geophysics writing it's such a broad ridiculous range of things that i've got to be able to do mm -hmm. but if i was to define myself i would say obviously i'm, I'm a roman archaeologist and a specialist in roman britain mm -hmm. and the military community in particular because those are the avenues where I've done most of my research and poured most of my efforts. But as you say, for everybody, it's a different path, a different route mm -hmm. and different opportunities. And it's not just whether you, you like science or you're a scientist or, or you're more historically based or you love photography or, or illustration or whatever those tool sets are really. But even if we take the Roman period of history and, and say, okay, let's break it down a little bit. And you've got military history, civil history, villa landscapes, environmental archaeology. You've got 400 years in Britain alone to have a go at. Mm -hmm. And then there's the immediate pre-Roman and post-Roman period, so let's say 600 years. That's an incredible breadth of time, mm -hmm. even in our own little island, mm -hmm. that we have to have a go at there. Mm -hmm. And the full range of humanity within that breadth. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the that's the beautiful thing about it. Mm. As it's funny, I, I was um, I, well, one of my questions that I, when I was driving over here, I was thinking mm. you know, I was going to ask you mm -hmm. was uh, why are the Romans? Because because so many people, <laughs> so many of my colleagues, for example, you, you just slightly stop at prehistory. Yeah. Lots of my prehistorian colleagues say that you know Romans are so boring. We know all about them. Really? But actually. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that question because I think. Well, I think, don't go on. You can if you want. No, no, no. no, 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 no I think actually we're both we're both sort of. I need a soapbox to stand. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Blame me your ears. Um, no, I think I think actually we've, we've sort of answered that question in a roundabout way. So mm. just, we've talked about tackling the cartoon character, yeah. which prehistorians often assume Romans, and also you just very eloquently explain actually it is so much 
No, it's more than yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, don't think we'll, I don't think we need to... to you you know what I think is, sometimes I think people are slightly frightened by the Romans mm. in terms of the, the, the volume of academic content that you have to get to grips with, perhaps, mm. if, you're going to, if you feel comfortable doing certain things well. Mm. Because there you do, for the first time, have to deal with history, you know, documents, letters, linguistics, linguistics different mm. sources, mm -hmm. um, much more in terms of politics, mm -hmm. you know, um, currencies, all these, you know, macroeconomics, all those things which you could pick up a newspaper today and find under the heading, you'll find an aspect of that mm -hmm. in Rome. But of course you find that an aspect in prehistory too, but you're dealing with a, with a, perhaps in some cases, a greater amount of data. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be slightly overwhelming. You know, for a lot of people, and that, that's my particular take on it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, I, I for a long time I sort of ran away from the Romans. You know, I grew up in <laughs> grew up in North Wales, our closest major city, major city, big town was Chester. Right. Um, for me, that well, well, my wife still jokes it's the centre of the universe as far as I'm concerned. Are you going past Chester? Are you? Um, but uh, in particular, so what frustrated me there was actually um, my house was. Just across a uh, rugby pitch from mm. from a, a bathhouse. It's the only uh, piece of Roman masonry in North Wales between uh, Wrexham and Anglesey. And um, very very interesting uh, site. I met the archaeologists when I was growing up and mm -hmm. talked to them about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, as uh, as I sort of came into my into high school and I sort of was approaching A levels, so I was sort of I became very aware that actually. Whenever, say, the council was doing something about history, it would just be, oh, the Romans were here, the Romans were here. But, but, but an awful lot else happened in yeah, Britain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, press that in as well. But who were the Romans, anyway? Well, exactly. which, which people were they referring to in parentheses? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Romans. The Romans. Yeah. So I can, I can <laughs> sort of see where, where people get a little bit better with it. But, yeah. but I have to say, again, something which is really well handled here, and in particular, for example, you know, we touched on on the number of shoes in the museum yeah. is actually the way that, that there is a sort of grittiness that comes out of the evidence. And mm. uh, so there's the, I love the, uh, the timeline, the way you used coins to sort of illustrate yeah. the population using coins, very, very clever, um, and the range of coins, but also little things like, especially as an archaeologist, it's very pleasing to see a Roman travel that you've uncovered. Oh yeah, it's very, yeah, yeah. You know, very well, that, that was a thrill to find. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. You get things like that, yeah. but it is the mundane. It's, it's the aspects of life. It's the bits that literally fall through the cracks mm. that make us human. Mm. And in the end, whether you're an archaeologist studying the Romans, prehistory, medieval, modern history, urban, whatever it happens to be, you, fundamentally we're all doing the same thing. We're mm. studying people, mm. and it's making those connections again. Mm. So, so really, one would hope that you know the the advice, if we want to call it that, um, is, is in a simple level. Is if you're interested in people, mm -hmm. if you're not interested in people, yeah, probably yeah. not the profession for you. Yeah. But if yeah. you are interested in people mm -hmm. and finding out more about people, then yeah, absolutely, yeah. there's a way in. Yeah, uh, I actually have a friend who, uh, well, a couple, a couple of friends who. Sometimes they, they get they're very, they're very very scientific in the big S kind of sense. Right. Very scientific, and um, they <laughs> often go, "Why do you have to?" Yeah, there's so much muddy ritual and things in archaeology. If you if you could strip that out, that'd be amazing. You're like, yeah, but that's the people. The messy bit is the people, and that's the reason why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Counting seeds when they get you so far. Well, this this is this is what's been so much fun, perhaps in the last thirty years of archaeology. I think in the UK, but also across Europe, is it you know archaeology used to be about lists. Mm. You know. Which, which completely dehumanizes everything. You, know, mm. you literally, you know, you, you categorize this, you list that. People got their PhDs by creating lists, <laughs> new lists on lists, mm -hmm. you know. But actually, they're, you know, they're false prophets. They don't, they don't really tell you anything that you need to know, perhaps, in many ways. What, what do you think is coming up in archaeology? What, what do you think are the challenges in the near future uh, for, for the profession? So the challenges facing archaeology in the years to come, mm -hmm. I think, fall into very different categories. But the main one is Britain, as we as we all know, is 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 continually changing. We have to make sure that changing Britain, if we're talking about Britain rather than world archaeology as a whole, that the the archaeology of Britain and the paths that we take, that we can rebuild connections with new communities to make sure that they find as much relevance and love and joy in the archaeology of this country 
um, as generations that have gone before them. And it's recognising more than ever that archaeology has to be out there in the public forum and to take people going forward with it. Mm. To be relevant to mm. modern society and future societies, we have to renew, constantly renew our relationship with the wider general public of the UK mm. and beyond. And I would hope that we're getting better and better at doing that all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's something that we must be completely and constantly vigilant about. Mm. Because at the, the moment we retreat back into a dark room and contemplate our navels and concentrate on things that only interest us and not perhaps the wider general public or, or a greater audience and we don't start continue to communicate is the moment that we, we lose our way very drastically. Mm. And so I think the challenge for us isn't just to communicate one way, to, to, to tell people what we're doing, mm -hmm. but to listen to the feedback that comes the other way and find out what people want to know. Mm. You know? Mm. And, and there has to be this two-way engagement. Mm. No matter what aspect of archaeology you're talking about, if you're talking about academic archaeology and universities, of course, vitally important that they do that too. Commercial archaeology, still the same thing, you mm. know, and those that fall between somewhere, even more important. People wax lyrical about community archaeology uh, for the last 10 years. It's been the great new thing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But the community that are involved with archaeology, and this is, this is the, the challenge for us all, is far wider than the immediate people who take part. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that we have to continue to to engage with mm. if, and that's not going to be our biggest challenge because if we don't we will become irrelevant mm. and perhaps we will deserve to be irrelevant yeah yeah that's a, that's a very very good answer and it was a very good thought so i mean i think uh people often mistake community archaeology for getting someone else to dig for you <laughs> <laughs> for free uh, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or 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 suppose mm. beyond that there as you say there is this tendency for um, for some, in particular, academic institutions, to retreat somewhat and, and almost see, mm. um, for example, I've found myself in situations in, in the course of the work that I do, uh, where I can't talk about or can't publicise the work that someone's doing, right. because they, um, well, frankly, they don't want the public to know about it. They want, they want, they want the um, the mystery of their job, of their role, to be intact, and I find that very, very strange. Well, I find that sort of attitude very mm. frustrating. Mm. I think, you know, obviously the, the model of Vindolanda really is one that, that can't exist without public support. Mm. Mm. Um, but I don't see anything frightening in that. In fact, I see it as extremely empowering. Mm. And it doesn't diminish something mm. um, for a greater collective to be involved in thinking about and asking the questions. And this is, this is so important about the, the sort of the engagement going forward. Mm. But for a lot of my colleagues, it isn't something that perhaps comes naturally to them. Mm -hmm. It's something that they've got to continue to work on. Mm -hmm. And as a profession, we must continue to work on because it's the only way, as I say, that we will remain relevant going forward into the future. Okay. Well, on that note, um, thank you very much for your time, Andrew. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs>